Welcome everyone. This week we are going to be focusing our attention on uh, the saints, what we call in our Catholic tradition the communion of saints, which is central to our belief as Catholic Christians. And it's especially apropos that this is our topic this week because we are going to be celebrating the Feast of All Saints on Monday, tomorrow, and the Feast of All Souls on Tuesday. So we'll talk about the relationship those feasts have to the secular celebration that's dominating today, October 31st, that is uh, the Feast of, not the Feast, but the secular holiday, not a holy day, of uh, Halloween. So welcome to all of you. Uh, for those of you who can't join us, I hope this was uh, helpful for you uh, to have this recording. Next week, we're going to be looking at the most fundamental teaching of our Catholic faith, that is the Trinity, that we believe and worship one God who has revealed himself to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal and co-eternal with one another. Deacon Scott Perhill will be making that presentation next week, so make sure that's uh, on your calendar and you're joining us on the Zoom call next week, you'll get an invitation on Saturday, uh, just as you, if you have this week. Um, we want to begin with a word of prayer, as always, and we're going to take the opening prayer for the Solemnity or the Feast of All Saints, because it's a, a beautiful summary of what we believe and why this is so important to us as Catholics. So you can pray along with me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty ever-living God, by whose gifts we venerate in one celebration the merits of all the saints, bestow on us, we pray, through the prayers of so many intercessors, an abundance of the reconciliation with you for which we earnestly long. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, when you become a member of the Catholic Church, it's like getting married. Uh, when you find the love of your life, the spouse, you're not only marrying them, but you're married into an entire new family. And sometimes those families are marvelous, and sometimes they're a little bit more like uh, the Adams family. But whatever the case may be, the church is a gigantic spiritual family. It includes all those who go before us in faith, all those who are living now in faith, and all those who will be uh, part of this community and this communion into the future. From the earliest days of our Catholic faith, uh, the communion of saints, this recognition that we are supernaturally and spiritually united to all those in faith who went before us, that teaching has been part of our Catholic faith from the very beginning. And one of the places you can see this is in what we call the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is the earliest extant creedal statement we have of the essentials of the Christian faith. Creed just comes from the Latin phrase, I believe. In Latin, I believe is credo. And so from credo, we get the term creed. And the Apostles' Creed comes from the second century, so very early on. That's the 100s in early Christianity. And it was intended to be a summary of the Bible, of the New Testament teachings about Jesus and what we believe as followers of Jesus. So it's good to just think about it as a kind of summary. If someone asked you, hey, what do you believe? As a Catholic, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about Jesus, uh, the nature of the church, salvation? What are the essentials of the faith? When you summarize your faith beliefs, that's a creed. I believe. Remember, that's what creed O means. And so this early Apostles' Creed was professed immediately before someone was baptized. So during the early centuries of the church, as we discussed last week, uh, most people became martyrs for the first uh, three centuries of Christianity. Uh, it was illegal to be a follower of Jesus, so they had to meet in secret oftentimes. Many, many martyrs from this era. It was pretty significant to profess faith in Jesus. But the church wanted to get a kind of irreducible minimum. What are the essentials of faith that a person is professing when they come 
into communion with us and in union and communion with the person of Jesus Christ. So this creed is recited at our baptisms when people are received into the church. Oftentimes during the season of Lent, we recite this creed versus the longer creed that's normally recited on Sunday because it goes back to our ancient origins. On Sundays or great festivals, like we'll see tomorrow, the Feast of All Saints, we recite together as a community the larger, longer creed called the Nicene Creed. That creed comes out of two early church councils. In uh, 324, 325 is the Council of Nicaea. Nicaea is a city now in modern Turkey, one of the centers of early Christian communion. And there was a later uh, Constantinople Creed when Constantine makes uh, what is today Istanbul his capital. Uh, there's a later creed that reflects more deeply on the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. And when you put those two councils together, the creedal statements that come out is the creed we recite every Sunday. So it's a little bit longer. We get more specific about what we believe about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and uh, our faith. So the Apostles' Creed is the simpler of the two. And if you look there, uh, you see it begins with our belief about God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. We specifically say we believe Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffers under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit is the next line. So there's the Trinity. And then I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. That's our topic this week. The forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So from the very beginning, this idea of the communion of saints, the shared life, between all those who are in Christ, uh, we see is there from the very beginning. So it's one of the extraordinary gifts we have as members of the church. We not only have our local parish family that we become a part of, but we have a larger universal family. That's all those who profess in faith in Christ around the world and all those who went before us in faith. And the role of the saints who go before us is they are praying for us they want to strengthen us in faith. They want us to be where they are. They're in full eternal union and communion with Jesus, and they want that same boon for each one of us. And I don't know about you, but like this cow, I need all the help I can get. I need the help of the saints. I need the prayer of the saints. And because they were gifted to me by Jesus Christ, I want to take advantage of every opportunity to grow in my faith. When I began uh, studying the truth claims of the Catholic Church and reading early Christianity, I learned about many of these extraordinary saints, um, many of them martyrs, who uh, died uh, to profess their belief in Jesus Christ. And so I felt this connection uh, with all those who went before us. Well, it's worth stopping and asking now, what do we mean when we say saints? Because we might have the same vocabulary. You might say the word saint, and uh, another person says the word saint. Same vocabulary, but we might have very different dictionary definitions. The danger is that we reduce saints to the super saints. This year, we're celebrating Saint Joseph in a particular way, an extraordinary um, person of God, one of Jesus's first disciples, of course, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Or we reduce the saints to simply those figures that are stylized in beautiful stained glass windows, or we see in murals on the wall, like here at the cathedral in Los Angeles. And we're down in the pews and the saints are up here. But that's not what the Catholic Church teaches about the saints. The saints aren't simply those who have died and are in heaven now with Jesus. The saints are, in fact, uh, the unity in Christ of all the redeemed, those on earth and those who have died. So you can see that the saints aren't just those who've died, but all who are redeemed by Jesus Christ, those on the earth 
and those who have died. So members of the church are part of that reality called the communion of saints. There's a family. I used to, when I talk with kids, I say there's the family that lives upstairs and there's the family that lives on the ground floor. We're still on the ground floor and we've got other family members upstairs. Their aim is to worship Jesus by interceding for us, by praying for us. So all of us are part of that reality. Saint just means holy, and holy simply means to be set apart for God's purpose. So we all want to be included in that reality. The term God's holy people goes all the way back to the Psalms. The Psalms talk about how the Lord uh, loves his saints. Uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, when it talks about followers of Jesus, they are called saints, those living on the earth. Uh, among the Pauline epistles, the one-third of the New Testament, those letters that Paul writes to different Christian communities, no less than 40 times he calls those who follow Jesus, those who are redeemed in Christ, as that definition from the Catechism says, he calls those people saints. But there are kind of three stages of that idea of saints, and we ideally will fit in one of those stages. We enter this through Christian baptism. That's how we enter the communion of saints, and that sets us on the trajectory. So some of you have been previously baptized in a Christian tradition. Some of you will, will be baptized as part of this process uh, when you also come into the Catholic Church. But here's the three stages. There's the saints in progress, there's the saints in purification, and there's the saints in perfection. So the members of the church on earth are the saints in progress. We're growing into what God desires us to be. We've been set apart by our baptism, but he's continually sanctifying us and preparing us. We believe that those who die in faith with heaven as their destination We'll also go through a period of purification. It's like the mudroom to a great house where we're purified, cleansed of the last vestiges of self-love. Any kind of attachment that we still have to persons or things or uh, vices in our life where we've merited heaven by the grace of Jesus Christ, but there's still this purification that has to happen. The term for that state is purgatory. You've probably heard the term purgatory before. So it's not a third destination. Uh, there are only two places to go in the next life, the place where we're united with God and a place where we're separated from God. Purgatory is a state, not a place, a state of purification. So we have saints that will die with some vestiges of sin still in their soul. They'll go through a state of purification. That's the second stage. And then the third stage are the saints in perfection, those saints who are now fully with Jesus in heaven uh, and are the, now interceding as part of his heavenly family for each one of us. And each one of these stages are beautifully entwined and connected. We're united with the saints being purified, and we're united with the saints in full communion, those saints in perfection. The church sometimes calls this the divine economy. Now, typically, we only use in the modern world the term economy to sp speak about uh, the material goods and services that are exchanged in certain countries or communities. But the divine economy, economy just comes from the Greek word, which means the household. The divine economy means we're part of a family that is sharing spiritual resources with one another. And the great thing about the divine economy is there will never be a recession, that it remains a constant. And it means, again, that all those who went before us in faith are still united to us. They're praying for us, and they're sharing gifts with us, just as we share gifts with members of the body of Christ, the church here on earth. A few years ago, I was asked to participate in a trip to... Um, Turkey. And we were visiting the seven churches of the book of Revelation and the places uh, where St. Paul taught 
in Turkey and then later in Greece. And I was the only Catholic on this pilgrimage along with a couple other scholars and a group of college aged members of the Church of the Nazarene. And so they're a Protestant uh, denomination. And one of the most frequent questions I was being asked on this was, what do Catholics believe about the communion of saints? Because so many of the places we were visiting were places where great early Christian leaders, people we call saints today, like uh, St. Basil and uh, many saints of Cappadocia and many of the great martyrs, places where St. Paul lived and St. John the Beloved and St. Apollos and St. Aquila and Priscilla. So they asked, what is this that Catholics believe about the communion of saints? And what was so fascinating is their own misunderstanding is what they objected to. But when we walk through the principles behind what we as Catholics believe about communion of saints that most Protestants don't, it was very rational and reasonable to them. And they said, oh, yeah, that that actually makes sense. So what I begin with is kind of three ideas. And the first idea is, would you agree that we're all called by God to prayer? And prayer is our expressed relationship with God. Prayer is um, petition, conversation that we have. And so they would say, yeah, we believe we're called to prayer. And would you agree that St. Paul actually says we're obligated in a sense it's our it's our duty to pray for one another that we should pray for other members of the body of christ and they all said yep we believe that too and i said you have people in your life that are prayer warriors that you know are very close to god here on earth and and that their particular prayers are especially powerful so when you're in a time of great need are there people you go to and say pastor or, or a dear friend a longtime christian would you pray for me? Because I, I, I believe in the powerful intercession of your prayers. And everyone said, yeah, of course, there's certain people in my life I really ask to pray for me. And that's actually in the scriptures too. James tells us that the prayers of a righteous person has great power. And he mentions Elijah, who was a man like us, but he prayed fervently in his day, hundreds of years before Jesus, that there would not be rain as a sign for the wicked king of that time. And for three and a half years, there was no rain. And then when he prayed again for the heavens to open, they did. So the prayers of a righteous person are powerful in their effects. So we agreed on all of these principles. We need to pray and we need to pray for one another. And as part of the body of Christ, we all have a part to play. And in that body of Christ, we share gifts with one another. So there are many gifts in the body of Christ. Uh, some people are given the gift of mercy. Others, the gift of administration to be leaders. Uh, some to be shepherds. Some to be great evangelists. Some are given special gifts of knowledge. And we're intended or given those gifts to share those with the whole community of faith, the whole body of Christ. So we can all agree we're called to prayer. We're called to pray for one another. And we recognize that there are certain people whose prayers are especially powerful because they're very close to the Lord and that we're intended to share gifts with all the other souls in the body of Christ. So on all those points, we agree. What differs is most evangelicals, most Protestants believe that when you die, that terminates that shared relationship with people who are in Christ. That, yeah, I can ask my good Christian neighbor to pray for me now, but once they die, that relationship ends. And that's where Catholics are different. We don't believe that death is more powerful than what unites us to Christ. Because we are all in Christ, death doesn't separate or terminate that relationship. Paul says it so beautifully in his letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8, he says, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor even future things, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any creature is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So death does not have the power to separate us from those who are in Christ. To give death that power makes death more powerful than Jesus. So if that's true, how do we communicate with those 
who have went before us in faith. We communicate to them through prayer. Now, this is the other little hang-up that needs to be clarified. In the 21st century, we have reduced the definition of prayer to worship, that you only pray to God because prayer is equal to worship. And that's not how prayer has been understood historically. Uh, you'll even see this in, in Old English, or if you ever watch uh, the proceedings of an English court, when they're addressing the judge in an English court, they will say, uh, pray the uh, judge to consider this uh, petition that I'm bringing before you. So prayer simply means to ask with earnestness or zeal as for a favor. That was the primary definition of prayer. And so that might be in a courtroom. That might mean to your landlord, you would offer a prayer. Uh, in more formal settings, it would be to make a formal request to a legislative body. So when you would propose a new law, that was a, a prayer, a special petition. So it's making a petition. It's asking. So when I ask my good Christian neighbor, hey, this is what I'm going through. Here's a special difficulty I'm facing. Will you pray for me? That's the same thing I'm doing when I ask a saint in heaven to intercede for me. It's just simply making a petition. Worship is for God alone. So when we speak of prayers to the saints, that means we're simply making a petition. We're not worshiping the saints. We're not short-circuiting our relationship with God. Any more than when I ask a neighbor to pray for me, it doesn't mean I can't ask God directly. It doesn't mean that Jesus is out of the picture. Uh, when I ask a person on earth to pray for me, I'm asking them to be a mediator, to pray on my behalf. And so in the same way, I can still pray directly to God, but I'm going to ask special people who are close to the Lord to pray for me and to share spiritual gifts for, with me. Remember that divine economy. I may ask them, uh, I might ask St. Francis, will you give me uh, a pray for the grace that is of the kind of detachment you had with material things so I might live more simply in my spiritual life and be closer to God. I love how the book of Hebrews puts it. He says, we are actually all surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And in the previous chapter, chapter 11, he gives the hall of faith. He talks about all those who went before us in faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, so many of the great saints of the Old Testament who went before us. And those souls still surround us like a great cloud of witnesses. So let us, therefore, he says, throw off everything that hinders us, all the sins that so easily entangle us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. And those saints, that great cloud of witnesses, are like the crowd gathered at the end of a great marathon. They are cheering us on that we will make it to the same place that they are. They are part of our sacred family tree. And so we are incredibly blessed. We have friends in high places, those saints who have went before us, who want us to reach the place that they are in eternal union and communion with Jesus. Because they love us, because we're part of the family of God, they want us to be there, and we can continue a relationship with them through petitioning them in our time of need. Now, as I mentioned today, today is Halloween. And Halloween uh, has many, many ancient roots, but most of what we do for Halloween today doesn't go back any further than the 20th century. Uh, dressing up in costumes and going door to door with a bag, saying trick or treat, that's a 20th century dynamic. Uh, there were earlier kind of celebrations, harvest feasts that were common in Europe. And there was some Celtic uh, pagan worship in the fall season that people believed that ghosts could torment you or harm you in certain ways during a certain season of the year. So what the church very often did when Christianity came to these pagan lands like Ireland and Scotland and England, they would look at celebrations that people had in their culture, and they would baptize those celebrations. They'd shift the focus from being fearful 
to being faithful. So the church established the feast of all saints and all souls during the same harvest time to get people away from fearing ghosts and fearing the dead, tormenting them or harming their family and saying, instead, you have friends in high places. We can pray for those who went before us in faith. They can pray for us from heaven, but we don't need to live in fear. We don't need to be afraid of, of ghosts or goblins. So All Hallows Eve, the, the night before All Saints Day, Hallows is where we get words like the Our Father, hallowed be thy name, holy is your name. All Hallows Eve was the, a time of spiritual preparation for All Saints Day, just like Christmas Eve is preceding Christmas Day. But of course, the secular world has kind of taken over this time and completely removed the spiritual component of it. So tomorrow is the Feast of All Saints. It's the day we celebrate this great gift that Jesus has given us, the gift of our family of God in heaven, our friends in high places. So I really encourage you, try to attend one of the Masses tomorrow. We have five different options for you. You can go at 7 a.m., 8, 15, 12, 5, 30, or 7 p.m. if you can follow along in Spanish. It's called a holy day of obligation. So it's not a simple holiday. A holy day of obligation means this is an essential part of our faith. And attending mass on that day is an expression of our commitment to our faith. Just like attending the mass on Sunday is a spiritual obligation. It's the irreducible minimum of us saying, thank you, God, for the gift of faith. I'm going to, at the very least, go to church on Sunday. And added to those Sunday celebrations, we have about half a dozen feasts or celebrations during the year outside of Sunday, sometimes they fall on Sunday, where we want to be in the church celebrating a particular gift of our faith. So tomorrow, we celebrate the saints. Uh, the day after that, we celebrate what's called All Souls Day, and that's focusing on those who are in that second stage saints in purification. This is the day we pray for those who have went before us in faith, but are still in a state of purification. We ask for the Lord to speedily prepare them to fully enter his presence. And those souls in that place of purification, part of their purification is to do service there. And their service is also to pray for us. So this is a, a common time of the year when the church took a cultural practice uh, like the harvest feasts of the Celtic nations, and she gave it a spiritual spin. We see this, and we'll see this in the upcoming season of uh, Christmas. Uh, the secular world doesn't celebrate the season of Advent, which is the four-week period of spiritual preparation leading up to Christmas, but they focus on Christmas Day, and they've changed the holy day into a holiday, and instead of focusing on Jesus, we focus on this jolly fellow holding Coca-Cola. It's also a 20th century marketing scheme to remove the spiritual elements of a feast. But even St. Nicholas has a spiritual origin, even that we call him Santa, which means saint. We have the vestiges left of St. Nicholas, who was a bishop in what is today Turkey, and his faithfulness to the Lord uh, is the origins of many of our practices. He would care for the poor in his diocese where he served as a bishop, and he would sneak gifts and money into the shoes of poor people that they left outside the doors of their homes to help them in great time of destitution. And that became the practice of putting little gifts in stockings that we still have today or in some Scandinavian countries, they still put their wooden shoes outside the door and find gifts in them the next morning. So St. Nicholas is a, is a saint of great merit. We can ask him uh, through his intercession that we would have the same spirit of generosity that St. Nicholas of Mira had, uh, gosh, 1700 years ago. Other Christmas practices that we have today come from saints, like the creche or the nativity scene. That comes from St. Francis of Assisi, whose feast we just celebrated. He decided on Christmas long ago, 700 years ago, let's create a little 
manger scene, a live scene. Someone will dress up as Joseph. Someone will dress up as Mary. We'll have a manger for the Christ child. We'll bring in a, a, a lamb and an ox and an ass, and we'll celebrate this uh, feast by doing that. And then people took up that idea of Francis, and they started carving little creches that they could set up in their own homes. You'll find in both of our churches uh, this upcoming season, you'll have a almost a life-size creche set up in the front of the church in honor of St. Francis's impulse to unite us more fully with this great gift of Jesus coming into the world. What I want to close with is just 10 ways you can right now start connecting with the saints. And number one is become a student of the saints. Uh, we can all become instant experts because we have Google. So you can just Google Catholic saints. Uh, you can uh, go on to Amazon and get a book on Catholic saints. Learn more about some of the great heroes of faith. Uh, secondly, uh, well, and we do this because uh, learning about the lives of the saints can help us follow Christ more fully. St. Paul even said this while he was on earth to the Corinthians, and he also says it to the Philippians, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ, that people of great faith can show us unique and creative ways to follow Jesus. So imitating the life of the saints can draw us closer to Jesus. Here's another fun way uh, that you can connect to the saints. Go to the website saintsnamegenerator.com and you just click that button, find a saint for me. It's going to bring up a saint's name and then become a student of that particular saint. Now, one of the reasons why you want to learn about the saints is when you come into the Catholic Church, whether it's your baptism or your confirmation, if you're already baptized, you're going to choose the name of a saint, and you're going to take the name of that saint. It doesn't mean that we're going to call you by that name instead of your given name, but you're trying to cultivate a particular relationship with the saint who is going to join you in a unique way on your journey of faith. So you might want to use the saint name generator to learn about a saint or to help you pick a saint. Uh, if you go to our online curriculum at formed.org, F-O-R-M-E-D.org, you sign up, uh, not as an individual, but as a parish on that website. You select Holy Spirit Pocatello as your community. That includes you in our uh, yearly subscription service for free. Give them your email. And then you have access to thousands of movies, uh, videos, Bible studies, audio books, ebooks about our faith. And just type in the word saints. And you're going to find all kinds of extraordinary uh, movies about saints in our tradition, whether that's St. Paul from the Bible or St. Bakita, uh, the great saint who went from being a slave in Africa to being uh, a sister in a community of faith or St. Bernadette, who has been gifted a, a vision of Our Lady in the 19th century, you're going to meet some extraordinary figures. So that's a third way. Fourth, you can pick a work of mercy, like loving and caring for the poor, and find a particular saint who modeled that extraordinary kind of love to the little ones, like St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. All of us have heard of her. She gave her life in love to Jesus by serving the poor. So we might want to pick a saint uh, who's been engaged in a particular work of mercy. Consider your particular profession. Are you a doctor, a lawyer, a plumber? A, what's your profession? There's a saint attached to your profession. Just Google again your job, and you'll virtually always find a saint connected to that profession, either because that's something they did themselves or there was some aspect of their life that was connected to that particular profession. Or uh, number six, you might just want to find something in the Bible, a person in the Bible that you love, like David, King David, or Paul, or Peter, Martha, or Mary, or Mary Magdalene, and start learning about them and their life of faith and ask for their intercession for you to grow closer to Jesus. You may want to look to a saint of your particular particular ethnicity. So maybe you're from primarily from Ireland or England or Italy 
or Bulgaria, or like the saint you see portrayed her, Saint Kateri Tekawitha. She was a, an, an early Indian saint who worked with the Jesuits as they spread the faith of Jesus Christ among the Indian nations. And you might find a wonderful connection there. Uh, even something as simple as your hobby, like sewing or painting uh, or playing music, there are saints connected to that. And that's where you may find your connection. Look up the saint for your birthday. So if you're born on October 31st, find out who the saint of the day is. It's as easy as Googling again. Just put in your birth date uh, or you know the month and the year and the word saint, and you're going to pull up oftentimes half a dozen to a dozen saints connected to this day. Maybe it's the day they were martyred, the day they were born, or the day they died of other causes, and they're connected to this day. And that's a wonderful way to connect with those who've went before us in faith. Number 10, learn about the saints that are connected to our community of faith. We have St. Anthony Chapel on 7th Avenue. St. Anthony of Padua was an extraordinary saint. Uh, in the same community of Francis of Assisi, St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus. That's our other chapel over on Hayes. Uh, you may want to learn a little bit about him. And if you feel a connection to either of those saints, uh, that might be a saint who's going to be a special gift to you on this journey. So uh, I hope you can connect more deeply with this principle of the communion of saints. They're extraordinary gifts to us. And I want to just end with uh, a contemporary practice that you might heard heard about today. How is someone declared a saint? How do we distinguish the saints on earth from those saints who are in heaven? So very often in the news, you'll probably see the Catholic Church has just declared a new saint. Uh, early on in Christianity, uh, it was easy to identify who the saints were because they were among the martyrs, those who died for faith in Jesus Christ. That's as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. We still have martyrs. There are uh, organizations and nonprofits who catalog every year the martyrs that are still being made today. Do you know there are thousands of Christian martyrs, Catholics who die for their faith Every year still in places like Somalia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, countries where they can't practice their, their faith openly. You might remember those Coptic Christians, those 21 men who ISIS beheaded on that beach. And those are part of our saints today. So early on in Christianity, it was easy to identify those who had died in faith. And you could uh, ask to pray for you from their union and communion with Jesus and then over time, just extraordinary figures, uh, people just automatically acknowledge when they die, that person is certainly a saint because of the virtuous way they lived. Hundreds of years ago, the church decided to establish a kind of set process to regulate who is identified as saints. And so there's a four-step process. Uh, when someone dies in faith, uh, their cause for sainthood, it's called a cause, say you had an extraordinary member of your parish community, you would submit their cause to the congregation of the saints and say, this person lived a life of great virtue and faithfulness. We're certain that they're now in heaven with Jesus, and we would like them to be declared a saint. So that's the first process. And in that process, that person is invoked as the servant of God. So there'd be servant of God, Larry, or servant of God, Dana, or servant of God, uh, Rebecca, or Bernadette. And then in that process, the congregation would look at that person's life. They would assign people to look at your old journals and diaries and talk to people who knew you and your family members to assure that you lived an extraordinary life of virtue. And then once that's established, uh, then you would be called a venerable that is, you're worthy of veneration, that your life is a model for other people to follow. The third step of that person being declared a blessed is if you can associate a miracle with that person's intercession. And at this stage, the church brings on board non-Catholic secular doctors to look at extraordinary medical cases where there's no 
rational medical explanation for why someone got better or why someone came back from being dead or their body was suddenly uh, didn't have cancer in it when previously their bottle body was riddled with cancer. And when they can discover that that family interceded to a particular person for the healing of that individual, then you associate the miracle with that person. And then, then that, individual in heaven is called a blessed. And then the final stage is a second miracle. And once that second miracle has been verified, then the person becomes a saint. So this isn't divine revelation. It's not a dogma or doctrine. It's just simply the process the church has put in place for calling a particular person a saint. And they can be very, what seem to us to be ordinary people. So right now there's, um, Blessed Chiara Badano, a young teenage girl who faced uh, her own uh, disease with great virtue. And so she's going through this process now after her death or her name is being taken through this process. And very soon we expect her to be declared a saint. But remember, this is the process for all of us. So as saints in progress, one day, Someone may put our cause forward, but even if they don't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't keep us from being saints. We don't make saints in heaven. We're simply acknowledging on earth that that person is certainly in communion and union with Jesus because through their intercession, extraordinary things are being accomplished on earth like healings. Leon Bloy, a great Catholic uh, person, said, the only real sadness, the only real failure, the only great tragedy in life is not to become a saint, not to become set apart, holy, living an extraordinary life by following Jesus. So that's our goal, that our life becomes imitatable, that the way we follow Jesus, we can say like St. Paul, imitate me as I imitate Jesus Christ. Let's close. Uh, with the prayer after communion that you'll hear tomorrow at All Saints, because it's, again, another sum up of this wonderful, extraordinary teaching. If you have questions, don't hesitate to email me this week. Uh, again, please be on the call uh, on the dot at 1230 next week. Hopefully we can work out the problems we're having with Zoom, because you don't want to miss Deacon Scott's presentation on the Holy Trinity We'll see you then, and let's close by praying together in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. As we adore you, O God, who alone are holy and wonderful in all your saints, we implore your grace so that coming to perfect holiness in the fullness of your love, we may pass from this pilgrim table to the banquet of our heavenly homeland through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hey, have a great week. Thank you for letting us be a part of this journey with you. And we look forward to continuing with you uh, on your journey of faith. God bless you. Take care.